So, um, I suppose you know I've got to refer to notes or else I'll go off on a thousand tangents and uh, we'll lose track of the thread here. So, um, <coughs> in, terms of, in terms of archetypal energies of each season, um, of course, you know, the spring is about birth and the summer is about growth. And so this time of uh, verdancy and fertility and of massive growth that we find in nature is, as I like to say, the time of the naturalist. Um, you know, it's the time for the John Mears of the wood of the world to the Henry David Thoreau's of the world to um, to explore. And I say that in terms of tea because it's a time that you can. Um, I like to have some curriculum around the study of tea that changes each season and evolves. And so each year you're going deeper into the groove of whatever that season is about. And so I might be, you know, specifically focused on ecology and terroir and tea propagation for one summer and growing regions. And the next summer, it might be about a specific varietal and wanting to try some of those teas and learn more about why those varietals grow well in that certain set of conditions. Um, and or I might want to learn about seed propagated versus tea grown from grafted clippings. And so I'll really explore that. These are all just examples of ways that you could approach studying the the ecology and the agriculture and the terroir and the weather in different growing regions around tea and specifically we explore those aspects of it in the summer um, because of this quality of of naturalism right whereas um, tea processing so what makes a white tea a white tea and a red tea a red tea and brewing methods. So, you know, brewing with side handle versus brewing with gong fu with small pots and cups or um, leaves in a bowl or matcha. We tend to, exp to reserve the study of the brewing methods for the metal element in the fall. And the reason is that the metal element is cutting. It's exacting. When you describe things that are metal, it's used for scraping, cutting, uh, for surgery, for peeling away the layers, peeling away the fat, etc. And metal specifically, symbolically, refers to the um, threshing tool used to harvest grain, to, to, so to separate the wheat from the chaff. So in a lot of ways, it's about understanding the value of things, the worth of things. Um, and metal, of course, refers to precious metals. The precious metals down in the earth, you know, gem, gems and crystals and golds and this. It's about understanding value. So we explore more of the, the brewing methods and um, tea processing and breaking it down into steps um, as part of the study in the fall. Right. So I hope this distinction makes sense. Um, you know, over time, the brewing methods become they change with the season. Right. So actually, in the summer, I tend to brew more gong fu. We're, we're drinking side handle because I didn't know how many people were coming this morning. Um, but typically in the summer, I'm doing more just leaves in a bowl. Very simple, large leaf teas, which we're going to talk about today. Um, or I'm doing aromatic and floral and sweeter teas like oolongs and green teas and white teas and brewing them in little small pots and into cups that really open up the aromatic qualities of those teas. Um, also, oolongs are much more finicky. They're more difficult to brew. And so brewing them in uh, gong fu, you have a lot more control over the factors. You just brew a better tea. Gong fu is about the craft and art of a perfect cup of tea, whereas side handle is about equanimity, ceremonial practice, meditation, brewing for a big group, it's about putting down qualitative mind. So it's not so much uh, side handle tea is really just about about letting go, about resting and mindfulness, about sharing with the group. With gong fu, you're getting into the art of tea. 
And so that's better for teas that require more skill to brew, like oolongs and green teas. <clears throat> so, okay. Um, this is why I need notes, guys, because otherwise, who knows where we're going to end up here. Um, so, all that's to say, in, the ex in your exploration and study of tea, of course, you can study whatever aspect of tea you care about at any time of the year. But for me, having some following the seasons, we're trying to follow the way of the seasons. Um, you know, I often refer to this quote from the Tao Te Ching, which is man or woman follows the earth, the earth follows the cosmos, the cosmos follows the Tao, and the Tao follows that which is natural, or the Tao follows itself. So I mention that because um, tea as a way, as a practice, is very much an earth based practice. Taoism is very earthy, right? When we think of those early Taoist monks, you know, that's where herbalism, Chinese herbalism was born from Taoism. All Qigong, Tai Chi, a lot of the martial arts came out of observation of animals. It's earthy stuff. It's rootsy stuff, right? And, um, you know, tea is a medicinal herb for was for a very, very long time before it turned into a beverage, right? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, but as a medicinal herb, um, it comes out of these earth-based practices. And so, um, breaking tea down into a study of the scientific approach to tea is in some ways a betrayal of tea as medicine. So there's a place for it in a life of tea, but it shouldn't be the central place, right? We have to first to cultivate a relationship that is not extractive. So what that means, you know, if you, I, I did a talk last week on sustainability in tea, um, and I go pretty deep into the evolution of tea and agriculture from the agricultural revolution up through the industrial revolution. If you want to really understand sustainability in tea, you can refer to that talk if you want to. Um, so that's not going to be the focus today. But um, my encouragement is tea is not something we use to get some health benefits or that we use. You know, having we have a very extractive relationship to a lot of these medicinal herbs and plant medicines. And it's not about how we use them to get this effect, to get this benefit. It's about the relationship that we de develop with them. And that relationship, if it's respectful and we really, we really develop a dialogue with these plant medicines, they can be profoundly transformative in addition to, being, to having health benefits. So I just say that because try to notice when you have an extractive relationship to something versus when you have um, a relationship that's reciprocal, mutual. Um, and you'll notice that it deepens, especially with tea, your relationship to tea. So, okay. Um, so, The one thing I want to start by saying is that something you'll notice that's consistent throughout what I'm going to talk about today, with some, which are the life of a tea tree. So some of the different varietals and growing regions and terroir. There's one consistency that um, is distinct to all the different varietals and types of tea. And that, that consistency is that the environment is as much the tea as the tree itself. So we often say the leaf is the tree's expression of its relationship to the environment. You can take two varietals and plant them in two different regions and they will produce completely different teas, right? So as we often say, you are drinking the weather, you know, that cloud or the water that you're drinking right now was a cloud a week ago. Um, and this is one of the things, not only psychologically, but 
physically that you can explore through tea is the way in which we're literally drinking the season, we're drinking the age of the trees, we're drinking the weather, we're drinking the ecosystem, the biodiversity, the molds, the fungi, the lichens, the other plants that have symbiotic relationships with the trees. With these old growth uh, trees, when you get into the tree, you'll notice it is covered in mosses and lichens and cobwebs and other plant species. And um, there's, a, there's a plant called crab's claw, which grows in this really interesting way. It almost looks like uh, seaweed and it grows all through the tree. And when we pick it, we dry it out and then you can add it to like uh, poor tea that's only a couple years old and it makes it taste like a 20 year old poor so um, And part of it's because they have a symbiotic relationship. It's absorbing all these nutrients from the tree and vice versa, right? They're exchanging nutrients um, So in a biodiverse environment the other trees growing around the tea tree have an extraordinary influence on the tea so when you have wild rose bushes, what's called what's called uh, mei gui hua, it's a Chinese herb. If there's wild rose growing in a tea forest, the trees, the tea that is produced from those trees will have these qualities of, of rose and the aroma and flavor, right? This, this interaction with the environment, tea is incredibly absorptive, right? So, and we have receptors for tea that we're affected by it, right? It's not... You know, the scientific approach wants to say, yes, there's caffeine and some theanine and a little bit of uh, GABA. That is not what is causing tea to make us feel the way that it does. It's so much more complex than that. Um, the, the biochemical relationship that we have to tea and what we call the chi, the prana, life force, right? And part of the complexity of that is all of the minerals in the soil, the plants, the animal life, the precipitation, the type of sunshine, is it on the east or west side of the mountain? All of that is informing a tea tree. If a tea tree is 100 or 300 or 500 or 1,000 years old, it absorbs and alchemizes all of that for hundreds of years. And then that gets concentrated in the leaves and produces this tea. And then we put the leaves to sleep and we bring it back. We wake it back up with water and fire, right? And that experience of interacting with that tea is an experience of interacting with all of those environmental and climactic factors. So it is very, very complex. It is not broken down into biochemistry and polyphenols, right? So, okay, that's just a little bit of the, an overarching thing is that terroir and the environment are our tea. You cannot separate the tree from the environment. Um, you know, another saying we have in our tradition is, if you love tea, you have to also love nature, you know, because you can't separate these things. Um, okay. <clears throat> or, or the question is, how do you love a leaf without loving the forest? And how do you love the forest without loving nature? Right. Okay. Let's have a cup of tea. So you can't, I can't say too much about the uh, life of a tea tree without saying something about uh, the history of tea. In last week's talk, I went 
deeper into this, but you know, the relationship between humans and tea trees is ancient. It predates written history. And part of the reason we can't identify really when we started um, drinking tea or cultivating a relationship to tea is that emperors have rewritten history, Chinese emperors, to claim revered aspects of tea culture. So emperors keep moving the dates around to try to make it the stream lead to them as being the ones who brought some important development in tea culture. So we all know that history has been rewritten over and over by different people, right? Um, but, you know, the likely early origins um, of this kind of love story, one of the dates that you hear a lot of people agree on is 2700 BC, because there's a... Um, one of the origin stories of tea, it's obviously mythical or mythological, is that Emperor Shanang, um, he was he that he had a glass stomach, and that he would travel through the forest and he would try all these different herbs, and that he brought Chinese herbalism to the Chinese people, and he would try all these different herbs, and then he would observe what they were doing in his organ systems in the body. Um, that's probably more symbolic, right, than it is obviously literal. Um, and that one day he drank, uh, he prepared uh, monk's hood, or it's also called wolfsbane, which actually I noticed yesterday is now in full bloom in the forest up here. And wolfsbane is uh, very poisonous, the roots. Um, they farmers, it's called wolfsbane because they would put the dried out roots into meat and they'd throw it out to the wolves like um, shepherds would or farmers and it would kill the wolves and sort of give the message of like, don't steal my chickens or whatever, right? Um, and so supposedly Shanong drank some wolfsbane or some um, monk's hood and as he was dying, he was sitting under a a tree a tea tree and he had a, a ding which is like a little squash gourd next to him and the leaves of a tea tree hurt saw that he was this important herbalist was died this man who loved nature was dying and some leaves it some leaves fell off the tree landed in his ding he drank it and it immediately um, detoxified his body of the poison or neutralized the poison and then he declared tea the empress of all medicinal herbs um, I have a feeling it didn't happen exactly like that, but, um, you know, we do know that as early as 2000 to 3000 BC, people were already drinking tea regularly, um, in this part of the world. Um, and the, the region of the world where tea was growing wild. So these tea trees were growing for thousands of years, um, prior to, humans coming along and cultivating or domesticating or learning how to process in complex ways tea. Um, the area is, there's really three areas that we've identified. So one is um, in northwestern China. So it's the Tibetan plateau, if you can kind of geographically imagine this. And this is part of Yunnan province. That's where that story of Shannang probably took place. Um, Yunnan is a, the southwesternmost province in China. It's a very big province. And we believe that that was the first place that any tea trees in the world started growing. So in, in all likelihood, they were growing wild for thousands of years before humans came along. But indigenous people in that region, there are a lot of different tribes there who are still living in a way that's very similar to, I imagine how they were living thousands of years ago. It's one of the reasons I love traveling in that part of the world, because you come across these villages in the forest that seem like they may not have changed much for a very long time. And we believe that this is the birthplace of all tea. And um, it leads to the north to the Tibetan Plateau. And then another area where we know there was a lot of ancient tea trees is called um, Mengding Mountain. So that plateau leads to Mengding, which is in uh, Sichuan province. So this is a little bit north of, of Yunnan and east. 
And then the last place is what's called the, the Brahmaputra Valley. And this is where India and Myanmar or Burma and Tibet meet. Um, so this is an important part of the world because there are a lot of stories of Bodhidharma who brought um, Buddhism from India to China. And um, another one of the origin stories of tea is they say that Bodhidharma was um, sitting in meditation in a forest. And he became so frustrated that he kept falling asleep that he tore off his eyelids and he threw them on the ground. And, and declared, I'll never fall asleep or I will wake up, something like that. And that those two eyelids became the first two tea trees. And that those tea trees then uh, were harvested for their leaves and became an aid in meditation to support the, the practitioner to stay calm, but also alert and awake for many hours, for long hours of meditation. Is that obviously more symbolic and poetic than, than real? Probably. Um, but... What is important in that story is that Bodhidharma traveled from India to China. And I've got to think about the years of Bodhidharma. I want to say, I don't want to just start throwing things around. Um, I want to say he was in the five or six hundreds um, AD. Yeah. Yeah, so in the four four to five hundreds AD, 475, he arrived in southern China around 475. So we know that tea was being consumed m much earlier than this, but what is important is that Bodhidharma traveled. I mean, can you imagine traveling in the year 400 from India to China? Like, this is wild. Um, and bringing these Buddhist teachings, which became the foundation for Chan Buddhism and then later for Zen Buddhism. So he's a very, very important figure in the history of, of Buddhism. And one of the sort of early corollaries or relationships between Buddhism and tea, you know, and one of the reasons that monastic environments started to revere tea as a medicinal herb for their health, but also to support in long hours of meditation. So this is one of the early associations that starts to understand the relationship that tea has to inner work and to inner cultivation. So we have also evidence in, you know, Burma, if you've ever had Burmese food, which I think is the best food in the world, personally, but uh, Letpet, which is the tea leaf salad, it's a fermented green tea leaf salad. Uh, it's incredible. And we know that they've been eating this food in Burma. It's just one of their signature dishes for a very long time. Um, so we already see like a fully developed relationship to tea, both culinary and for the beverage for a very long time in this Eastern re regions of Eastern Burma, where it um, is near China. And of course, in Tibet, uh, milk tea has been consumed for a very long time. This is actually where Dave Asprey developed Bulletproof Coffee. And he likes to claim, you know, claim, I, he may claim that he learned it from this area, but there's a very important historical trade route called the Old Tea Horse Road that goes from Yunnan in Southern China through the Huang, um, Huangdian Mountains. And it passes over 20 mountain passes going all the way up the west side of China up to Tibet. So it ends around Lhasa. And this trade route is one of the reasons that poor tea started being produced in the way that it was because it's easier to travel with a tong or with all these cakes of poor pressed together on the back of these mules um, than it is with loose leaf, right? With loose leaf, you'd have to travel with these huge gunny sacks. Whereas when it's compressed into cakes, you can travel with a lot more tea. And in Tibet, in Nepal, 
they really relied on all the minerals and vitamins in tea in their diet because they primarily ate yak in yak butter and there's a very limited amount on those high plateaus limited amount of, of vegetables or fruit or something like that so they were really reliant upon all the health um, benefits of tea and they really prepare it more like a like a soup so there might be some herbs added to it and butter and milk and it's more like a stew like a tea stew that's consumed in in nepal um, and it's a, it has been a, a very important part of their diet for a very long time, right? So um, there's also this area in India, which is the Assam Valley. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, fi okay, finally, in terms of where tea kind of began, there's also areas of Cambodia, in eastern Cambodia around Angor, um, where we see these ancient, ancient roads leading to tea gardens that have been abandoned. So some of those trees have grown quite large. And this area of Cambodia has been po very politically unstable for a long time. And so um, there hasn't been a lot of exploration over the last hundred years of some of these old growth tea gardens because it's difficult to access. It's a really wild part of the world. It's relatively unsafe. Um, so we know that in Cambodia, there was tea being grown a long time ago as well. So this whole kind of region, right? In southwestern China, up the west coast of China, Laos, Vietnam, Burma, et cetera, Cambodia. So for those of us in the West, because I, I think everybody in here is in the Western world, um, it wasn't really until the Portuguese came along in the 1600s um, that we encounter tea in the West. So it's only been 400 years, right? That Westerners, or Europeans in this case, found tea. And the Portuguese found it, but they were more interested in spices and lacquers and a lot of other things that they traded with the Chinese. It was really the Dutch who engaged tea in a really big way. And um, they started importing black tea from Canton in China, and that's where the Chinese did trade with the Europeans. Um, and, and interestingly, green the Chinese were producing a lot more green tea prior to the 1600s, and they had to change the way that they were processing the tea to produce a black tea that could survive the very damp ships to travel all the way from China back to Holland, right? So in the 1600s, so they started oxidizing the tea and produced a, a really robust black tea that could survive these long journeys. So it's kind of an interesting way in which trade facilitated the evolution of, of a brewing method, right? Or not a brewing method, a, a process, a tea processing method. So, okay. All of that has very little to do with what we're really focused on talking about today, but I wanted to just give a little bit of context because the growing region, the type of mountain, the type of cultivar, um, all of this is contingent upon these historical developments in the way that the tea trees moved from one area to another, why they moved, and how the, the evolution of these cultivars, how they developed and grew. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, growing habitat, but, but about really the three primary cultivars of tea and, and why that matters. So let's take a pause, have a sip of tea, let me pour you a cup of tea.
So I want to start by talking a little about a little bit about growing habitat and climate. So when we talk about the tea tree, um, this is a general term for several what are called genera or or genus. A genus is a group is a group of something with common characteristics of Camellia sinensis. So when we talk about tea, we're talking about Camellia sinensis. Camellia sinensis, though, has ver different varietals. And there's three primary varietals of tea. The first one is the varietal sinensis. So it's Camellia sinensis varietal sinensis. And this is the Chinese tea, or Chinese uh, bush, or Chinese tree. Then there's the varietal Assamica, which is the Assam tree, or Assam bush. So it's primarily grown in Assam and India, right? And then there's Cambodi. So Camellia sinensis varietal Cambodi. And this is the Java bush. So this is native to Indonesia. Um, I'll try to make these distinctions more interesting here in a moment. So each of these genera or genuses, so sinensis, Assamica, Cambodi, has more subdivisions or what we call... Um, varietals of subdivisions of the general tea bush and there's more than a thousand sub varietals so all of this is to say what why this is important is that come all tea white tea green tea oolong poor all of it comes from camellia sinensis but then you've got these um, genera and then you have subdivisions and when you look at the subdivisions it might be the root systems are a little different, or the leaf serrations are different, or the way the um, branches grow is different, or they need more precipitation to thrive, or what have you. They produce a really thick leaf that's ideal for black tea or red tea, but it's no good for oolong. You know, you can't process it into a nice oolong, etc. So it's kind of one of the things that tea lovers that we find so fascinating is that you have this one tree but it can produce a mind-blowing variety of different types of white teas and oolongs and poors you know for those of you who drink tea regularly or frequently you know just in the world of of poor tea you could drink a different tasting poor tea every day for the rest of your life but it's all coming from potentially the same not only Camellia sinensis, but from the same um, genera, the same var varietal. How is that possible? What makes that possible is the biodiversity of the environment where the tree grows, combined with the skill and the technique of the person manufacturing and processing the tea. So it's part environment, and it's part the skill and the way that the person, the people process the tea. So just like in martial arts or Chinese herbalism, oftentimes families will be very protective of the way that they produce a tea. You know, they might roast or oxidize or pluck the leaves in a certain way or have secrets in the way that they produce that special oolong or that special white tea and they guard and protect those secrets because they don't want other people to start trying to imitate it and produce a similar tea, right? Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the three, um, the three um, uh, generas, so, or the three varietals. So as I said, the one is sinensis, the china bush, the second is Assamica, or the Assam bush, and the third is uh, Cambodi, or the Javanese bush. Now, let's focus first on the China bush. So this is native to China. And these trees really thrive in cool, mountainous regions um, that are pretty high altitude. So between 6,500 and 9,800 feet. So where we live here, up here in Telluride, we're at 9,000 feet, and we are way up here. Like, you know, we're surrounded by serious mountains. So you can imagine some of the growing regions for the China bush are really high altitude. 
are very mountainous regions. At that altitude, the temperature tends to be a bit cooler, right? So these aren't like jungles. These are more um, temperate mountain environments. And they have shorter growing seasons, right? Which for those of us who try to grow our own food up here, you know, the challenge is that the growing season is so short is that the minute you get one pepper off your pepper plant, you get your first freeze and everything dies. So these are shorter growing seasons. And um, these trees, the China bush trees, can tolerate frost, which is not true of all tea trees. So they don't like a lot of extreme temperature variation. So you'll see that they grow in latitude air, uh, regions where the, the variation in temperature stays fairly constant, but they can handle in the winter time some frost without dying, which is not true for the other trees. Um, they tend to grow a little bit smaller, like th around three to 10 feet. I wish I could show you guys pictures of the trees and the growing environments, but I think that'd be kind of challenging in this medium. Um, <clears throat> these trees mostly grow in China, Japan, Taiwan, and they've started to experiment a little bit in Darjeeling in Northern India. Um, the, here's what's most important about them. They produce very fine leaves, so small leaves. And those, leaves are hand plucked and traditionally processed and they pr they're primarily used to produce green tea um, the really soft fujian oolongs so if you've ever had yen cha from eastern china um, those those oolongs are produced with small leaves the really uh, smooth red teas that are kind of malty from yunnan from southwest china and um, Chimun red tea. So it's called, um, you've probably seen Kimun or Chimun Gongfu red tea that's produced in central China. So if you know any of those teas um, or you enjoy those teas, they come from this, the China bush, right? Again, more temperate, really small, very fine leaves. So this is the first primary um, varietal that we see. So I'll now talk about the other two. And there's important distinctions between these. I hope I'm not boring everybody half to death. I find this stuff fascinating, but um, for a lot of tea lovers, they don't, this is not interesting. They don't really care. Um, okay, the second one is Camellia sinensis and the varietal is Assamica. So this is the Assam bush or the Assam tree that we find, especially in Northern India, right? These trees really thrive in jungle-like conditions. So they want rich, loamy soil. So, you know, loamy soil means like there's a lot of sand and silt, but not too much clay. Um, and the soil has to be really light and has to drain a lot of water because of the, the root systems of these trees and it's slightly acidic. The average temperature where Assam um, bushes thrive is around 85 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are very, very hot climates. And these, they're jungles. If you travel in them, you feel like you're in the jungle, right? They're almost rainforest-like conditions in some areas. And very, very high humidity, tons of precipitation and rainfall every year. Um, and... The Assam Valley in, in northern India is actually a kind of a lower altitude, but oftentimes the jungles can start to ascend into the mountains that surround it. And um, you can see really good quality tea both at some of those higher altitudes but down in the valleys. Be these types of trees just thrive in those environments so you can produce better teas. Oftentimes you hear people say, the only really good tea in the world is produced at high altitude. That is not true. At lower altitudes, there are some very, there are some extraordinary teas produced in central Taiwan and northern India, etc. Um, so these trees grow to very high heights. So 35 to 50 feet. They can be huge trees. And um, 
you know, I've seen some of these trees, like the oldest tree, tea tree I've personally seen is around 2,500 years old. And it was in Yunnan, in this area around um, Linsang, where this one of our private reserve cakes is from, the purple tea. And that tree was huge. It was like 50 feet tall, maybe taller, 60 feet. And it was one of these Assam trees. Um, so Assam is known specifically for red tea. It's what we call black tea in the West. It's called red tea or hong cha in China. And we see this in Northeast India, right? If you've ever had Indian tea, it's probably been black tea or red tea. Um, Sri Lankan, all the tea that's grown in Africa is Assam tea. And, um, you know, this Assam tea, they've gotten very skilled, especially in North India, in producing uh, red tea, right? And some of it's very good. A lot of the Assam bushes have been hybridized with Burmese, a Burmese cultivar, and brought to Taiwan. And so if you've ever had, like, we have a tea called Elevation, another tea called Ruby Red. We have some other Taiwanese red teas. Those are hybrids of this Assam tree with a Burmese varietal that produce a certain sweetness in the tea. Um, and those Assam bushes produce uh, very big leaves. They're robust, they're big, they're, they produce a very full-bodied, very strong tea. And, um, you know, they're almost exclusively used to produce black, black or red tea, what we call red tea, what they call red tea. Um, so I wanted to mention that you can take an Assam tree and produce an oolong or a white tea or a green tea. It just probably isn't going to be very good because the tree wants to be produced. It wants to produce a certain type of tea. So there's this place, the Fukujuan uh, Research Center. It's, it's around, it's near Kyoto in Southern Japan. And they are growing 75 different cultivars there. They're doing a lot of experimentation from China, India, and Sri Lanka. And they're trying to use all these different types of cultivars to produce oolongs and green teas and white teas. And they're experimenting on, if you take Assam bushes or China bushes, you put them in Japanese soil, Japanese, Southern Japanese um, biodiversity environment can you produce a nice white tea or a nice oolong or a nice red tea etc so all this is to say any one of these types of trees can produce you know like in Japan they're taking teguanyin which is used for oolong and they're producing a green tea that has some of the sweet notes of oolong so all this is to say that like there's a lot of experimentation going on, a lot of failed experimentation, but occasionally they nail it. So this last year, um, a friend of mine in Taiwan, he took Taiwanian uh, processing method, which usually produces a sweet um, oolong tea, and he produced a red tea or what we call black tea, and it's incredible. So it's like a black tea or, or a red tea. I realize this is confusing. Red, what we call black tea, they call red tea in China, in Taiwan. So when I say red tea, I mean black tea. Think of black tea. I'm not trying to confuse all of you. It just happens sometimes. Um, so they're using an oolong processing method. They're producing a red tea. It's got floral notes, but it's got that body and richness and kind of chocolatiness of a red tea. It's incredible. So all of this is to say is that experimentation is happening and there's a ton of failed experiments and occasionally they go, wow, we produced a new type of tea. It's amazing, right? And some of that has to do with hybridizing different trees together and cloning. And, but generally speaking, wild trees that grow naturally in an environment produce a much better tea than all these hybridized um, uh, clones, right? My experience has been that the chi is much stronger, the energy is stronger, the flavors are fuller. Um, 
the more humans mess with tea, it tends to be that the the quality tends to diminish. Okay, so I want to talk about the third type of tea bush, which is the Java bush, and it's the varietal is called Cambodi. I'm not going to say a ton about this because it tends to produce an inferior type of tea. The reason that this varietal became popular is that it's incredibly robust. It's very, very um, resilient. And so it grows in these tropical and mountainous environments um, in Indonesia especially, but also it's grown throughout Southwest Asia. And the way you can recognize the um, Cambodi bush is that it flowers. So these, it doesn't grow into these big trees. It tends to grow into small bushes that are easy to, to turn into plantations and to harvest. Um, but they do a lot of, they flower multiple times a year. Um, and they produce a very high volume of tea. And so it's used to produce the inferior teas. Some of them are organic, but that often go into tea bags or it can be mass produced. Um, and also because it's growing in this tropical environment, you can harvest it up to two to three times a month. So whereas other trees like the um, China bush really ideally are harvested max four to six times a year. So if a tree can be harvested four to six times a year versus three times a month, you imagine the difference in yield, right? So in these tropical environments where there's tons of rain and the soil is very rich, etc., these tea bushes can produce tons and tons of tea. Whereas in other environments, it might only produce enough tea to be harvested a couple times a year, right? So of course, when you think about the demand for people, for tea producers trying to sell tea for profit versus people producing, you know, 30 tons a year or some, some small, a smaller quantity of tea, it's just a different relationship to tea. And this gets into commodification and profitability of tea, right? Um, okay, now, there's so much that can be said about all of this, but I don't wanna, I think if I go too deep into like how trees are harvested and processed and all that, everybody will fall asleep. Maybe not, but you know, it can get pretty technical pretty easily. Um, I do want to talk just a little bit about terroir and cause I find this, I find this interesting and I, and I think it's important. Um, any questions before I kind of carry on here into the next thing? Where are we at time-wise? 9 to 12? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of zip through a couple of things about terroir because I think these are important to understanding the life of a tea tree. And then um, I'll just take a few minutes for that. And then if you have questions, you can ask. Um, it's okay. It's a little challenging because mm -hmm. I ran out of my spring water, so you have to do it out of the fridge, which I mean, it's okay. I'll, let me get through the terroir stuff, and then I'll, we can interact with it. Later. All right. Okay. So, a couple kind of notes. One is that tea is grown in 39 countries around the world, it has grown and been propagated in a lot of different regions. You know, there are six classes of tea. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, there are thousands of minor variations in the leaf style and the shape. And so I think this is so remarkable, right? 39 countries, six types of tea, thousands, hundreds of varietals, but it's all coming from the same base plant, right? It's extraordinary the diversity of what's produced from this one tree. And, you know, so you could ask the question, okay, 
Um, the china bush, which is the first tea that we talked about today, um, it's it primarily produces, uh, or, or not primarily, it produces a red tea in northern Yunnan, but also a red tea in Darjeeling, which is in North India. But they're very, very different teas. So same bush, same varietal, um, two different growing regions. And in these growing regions, we have similar altitude, um, temperature range, climate, soil. So these growing regions are very, very similar. Why do they produce such totally different teas? Now, okay, so this gets into terroir, right? Or no, it gets into, it gets into manufacturing. So when the English, the English in the... 1700s they started producing a lot of tea in north india and they didn't understand that the same tree could produce two different teas like a green tea a white tea and a poor and so they started hybridizing and cloning and producing different varietals they started producing a very bitter red tea and green tea and they said all light tea is green tea and all dark tea is black tea. And they started calling it black tea instead of red tea. And they brought it back to England. And it was so bitter because they didn't know how to process it well. That's why they started incorporating a lot of milk and honey and sugar and other things, additives to the tea. Um, and it became English breakfast tea, right? Earl Grey, that kind of thing. Um, and it's because they didn't know what they were doing. And the reason is that the Chinese protected the secrets of tea processing for a very long time, for as long as they could. Um, and that's why in Assam, they started developing certain ways of processing the tea that produced from the same tree and similar growing climates a completely different type of tea than what they produce in Yunnan from the same tea tree. Right. So the, the processing method is very, very important. And it's not something that um, it is incredibly nuanced. And, you know, for example, some people consider oolong the most difficult tea to produce in the world. And some people consider the best oolong in the world to be Fujianese oolong in eastern eastern China. And every morning in the spring, the spring harvest is considered the best. There's a man, he's now passed in the last couple of years, but from the Huang family, every morning he walks outside, he stands in this little like gazebo thing at five in the morning, and he takes into consideration the air temperature, the light, the precipitation. And one morning every spring he says, okay, go. And literally thousands of workers that day go to work for two weeks without rest. They work in cycles. They sleep on the floor of the tea processing plant. All of the harvesting of all the leaves, all of the roasting, they take the tea all the way through the production cycle in two weeks and they don't stop. I mean, it's crazy, right? The amount of activity that happens for those two weeks. I think they have to drink a lot of tea to stay awake for the amount of work that happens during this period. But it's because one guy says now, and he is, he's considered, you know, a luminary. He's a, he was a very, very respected figure in the world of tea because he oversees the production of every single step, right? So the mats go outside, they go inside, they're sun dried. We have to do another roasting, another firing. It's incredibly labor intensive and it is exact. So this is for the best oolong in the world, right? There are secrets that went to, when he died, that went with him, right? About how to produce this type of tea. That, you know, he probably passed them on as best he could to his sons, but he was raised in that, those tea gardens in that area. Producing the finest tea in the world is, you know, it's not only very labor intensive, but the processing requires an incredible level of expertise. 
And it's something that I think is important for tea lovers to know because it's not just like accidental that a good tea is produced. It's the cooperation of the natural environment, of the trees, and then of incredible skill on the part of the tea processors, right? And it's important to know some of this because it gives us an appreciation for good tea, right? There's so much bad tea out there. It's incredible. You've probably tried some unless you have a good source for your tea. Um, and so this, you know, it is the varietal, the growing region, and the expertise of the tea maker that produces a fine tea. It's these three qualities, right? Um, so another example is east of Darjeeling in Assam, also in India. They produce, they're known for producing a very nice red tea. And they've continued to try to produce oolongs and green teas, and they just can't do it. And part of the reason is those Assam bushes are more ideal for red tea. They want to be produced into a red tea. But part of it is also that they don't have the skill to know how to take this type of varietal and turn it into a green tea. Whereas in other parts of the world, over hundreds of years, they've been able to take a varietal that wouldn't usually be used for an oolong or a green tea and produce a really nice green tea. And this is continuing to evolve. And it's part of what's exciting at the frontier or the front edge of tea production today is occasionally a new tea emerges. And it's the byproduct of lots of experimentation and a masterful expertise and understanding of how to produce good tea. So this is, I think, the last thing I want to say, because I realize otherwise I've, I've, I've talked a lot, and this is kind of a very heady topic. But, um, you know, the varietal that grows well in a certain area, it has a, a communication or a relationship with the environment. And, you know, Taiwan is known for its oolongs. And the varietals that grow, it's the China bush that grew in Fujian, which I was just talking about, where the most famous oolong in the world grows. It was brought around 300 years ago to Taiwan. And it grows well in the soil in the mountainous regions of Taiwan to produce a very nice oolong. But a lot of people would say you can never replicate good Fujianese oolong in Taiwan because there's a magic in the terroir that matches the trees. And an analogy that I've heard that I like is that somebody who really loves champagne knows that the champagne region of, of, um, of France, um, you can never match that with the sparkling wines that are grown outside of France in California or somewhere else. It just, there's something about the terroir that produces a very particular thing. Another example is that people have tried to uh, produce Roquefort, like a traditional Roquefort, Roquefort cheese outside of um, those limestone caves in France where it's produced, and they absolutely cannot reproduce it. There is something about the microorganisms and the air quality and the minerals and all of that that cannot be replicated anywhere else in the world. And this is why you know, people have tried to produce a nice poor tea outside of Yunnan, and they just have not been able to do it anywhere. So a friend of mine was visiting recently, and he lives in Mexico City. He's a jeweler there, and he's a tea lover. Um, and he just told me, yeah, they're trying to produce poor tea in the mountains outside of Mexico City. And I, I, I didn't want to laugh in a critical way, but I wanted to laugh in the sense of, there are people who are masters of tea production who have been trying to produce poor tea outside of Yunnan for a long time and failed over and over and over again. So to think that some folks outside of Mexico City are going to produce a nice poor just seems kind of ridiculous to me. So again, this is again to talk about how important terroir is. Okay. Um, 
You know, I'm going to say the production of the different classes of tea, so green, yellow, white, red, and oolong, for another another talk, because it's a dense topic. I want to give it an adequate treatment. And this gets into like oxidation and loose leaves versus compressed leaves and all of that. And into the actual tea processing, because that will then help you understand why a white tea is different than a green tea and why certain tea bushes are used. So it is related to this top topic, but um, it's I think it's too it's just too much information for this morning. Um, and hopefully my my general hope is that the next time you sit down for tea you have a little more appreciation for how much goes into that cup of tea. You know, there's so much. And I've just, I've just talked about the trees primarily today, much less all of the labor and then getting it from some remote region of the world to your cup. It's just a lot happens, you know, in between the tree growing wild in the forest somewhere to the cup of tea you're enjoying. And the more we understand about that, the more we can appreciate a fine cup of tea, right? And all the people involved in producing it and getting it to you. Okay. Any questions out there? I know that was a lot of information. I hope I, I hope it wasn't too much. Um, and if you have any questions, now would be a good time to ask. I was wondering if Japanese like green sencha is that the Chinese variety varietal usually? Um, I mean, Japanese tea is interesting. They've they've worked a lot with the China bush or what's called the China tree. They the Japanese are extraordinary in that. Of course, wild grown trees. As I was saying, <laughs> wild grown trees. So I don't know if all of you heard that question, but it was. The, the Japanese, what do they? What primary varietal do they use? The Japanese pride themselves on the automation of tea production. So even the finest sencha and matchas, you know, what they pride themselves on is we have machines that drive down perfectly organized um, aisles of tea bushes. And they're perfectly shade grown with the traditional material that lets in the right amount of sunlight. And these machines process the leaves and then gather the leaves and bring them to a station where they get dropped off on a conveyor belt. They're brought in every step at the most sophisticated tea farm or, or manufacturers. Every step is done by a machine hmm. all the way down to it grows from the leaf on the bush to in a package in a powdered form in matcha. And they pride themselves on that level of technological know-how. And I think there are things that are definitely lost in, in incorporating all of that automation and digital digitization of tea because there's a lot of subtlety in changes in um, the weather and the biodiversity. And so you remember that man I was talking about in Fujian, where they produce this oolong, he'll change factors in the same day. They'll bring thousands of these bamboo trays of the leaves that are drying out, outside and then back inside, and then outside and then back inside based on temperature changes and precipitation and like subtle variations. They'll harvest only the trees at one elevation and leave the rest until there's more humidity. And for him, it's by touch. It's not because he's sitting looking at a thermometer. It, it's being around tea from the time he was born until his 80s. And understanding all these subtle factors that go into producing the finest oolong. And when you drink teas produced by that family, there, there's nothing like them in the world. They're also exorbitantly expensive. And as one of my friends said you could have a jumbo jet and a billion dollars and you still can't access this tea because they only sell it to a small handful of people who they know are going to brew it gongfu and really care for them because they know how special the teas are 
They have others that they'll sell more commercially, right? But for the finest Fujinese oolongs, they only sell it to people who they know are going to love it and appreciate everything about it, every, every steeping of tea, etc. Um, so in Japan, um, they have done a lot of experimentation. And they've been very rigorous and disciplined in taking different cultivars. So both the Assam and the Javanese and the Chinese and all these sub varietals and hybridizing and cloning to try to produce the perfect green tea, right? And there are some farms that are very purist about it and they'll only work with one varietal, et cetera, and others that they might have 70 different varietals growing on the same farm, right? Um, there's a lot of difference in the growing regions in Japan. So in the north versus the south, they're very, very different environments. And so some varietals will thrive more in, in the north versus the south, right? And also there are some um, old growth uh, production is in the south where they pride themselves in the same way that um, in France, there might be a 200 year old vine that produces a uh, Beaujolais, a certain type of wine. And it is the 200 year old vine that produce in the environment, but that produces that wine. And so there are some older gardens in, especially around Kyoto and Uji in Japan, where they pride themselves on their old growth trees and how they take care of them. You know, in the same way that you would take care of a bonsai tree, you know, there are bonsai trees that are thousands of years old, right? And it would be like the most valued object, like a family heirloom that's been passed on for 2,000 years in a family is this bonsai tree. And everything else that they own is sort of secondary to their prized bonsai that's the centerpiece in the home. There's the same relationship to some of these old growth trees in, in southern Japan. So, and I'll, t I'll talk more about... Um, you know, Japanese tea production is not my area of specialty because I, I love ma good matcha and um, sencha and gyokuro, but my focus is really around Yunnanese pours and, and Taiwanese oolong and Fujinese oolong. So I know a lot less about the Jap the world of Japanese tea than, than people who focus on it, you know, so. Okay, any other questions out there? Hey, Colin. Uh, I had a quick question, or maybe we could open a discussion about this. Uh, a lot of this conversation has been about like cultivating the best tea for the best cup of tea. Um, and I've always loved tea. I'm not going to lie. I used to really love uh, like English breakfast and um, Earl Grey. <laughs> but uh, as I've explored through tea more and more um i have gotten a lot of different types of tea and there is one pu'er tea that just does not taste good to me and i know that it i know that it's really high quality and i know that it's like uh from one of these like i, I don't know it's either from living tea or global tea hat like it's a really high quality tea and it's i just do not like it so then i'm like am i do i know what a good cup of tea is <laughs> <laughs> is or is that just like a preference thing and now i'm like questioning like do i know do i know how to make a good tub, cup of tea do i know what a good cup of tea tastes like you know yeah interesting i mean is so is it a show or shangpur i uh, i don't remember off of the top of my head i could find out but okay. yeah I'm not, i can't remember. yeah so that would make a big difference that the if it's show or shang and then also, mm -hmm. do you know if it's young or if it's been aged? Um, I believe it's been aged, but I have other pu'ers that taste completely different from this particular one. So then I'm also wondering, like, is it, was it stored properly or, you know, I start thinking about all these other things. Yeah, I mean, the, the, well, so when you get a moment, find the name of it, and then I'll tell you more. I can I can actually look into that tea specifically and tell you more about it. But <laughs> with poor tea, if it's show or shung, that's very important because it has to do with the fermentation. And there might be something about the 
mustiness or the earthiness that's coming through in the fermentation that just doesn't resonate with you. You know, a young, a young Shungpur is closer to like a green tea. So it's got mm. that bitterness, it's bright and grassy and sensational and quite energetic, right? Those young poor Shungpurs, you really feel the tree, the energy of the tree. And then as a Shungpur ages, it's going to get much darker, more complex, more the energy mellows a lot. Whereas with Shopur, they speed up the fermentation basically by composting the tea. And so it produces really earthy, really fermented. And for some people, some people that that flavor profile does not, they don't like it, you know, and, um, you know, if what you've liked historically is more like Earl Grey's and things, they add bergamot and, and, um, mm -hmm. or in tangerine oils to it. But they're using that Assam bush that is known for producing these big hearty leaves that are um, make a really smooth, rich, bittersweet, chocolatey black tea, red tea, right? And then it's got the additives of flavors. So you might just have a preference in terms of flavor profile for that bittersweet kind of cacao flavor and that smoothness of the brew. Whereas poor is, is earthy. I mean, it tastes like soil, right? And when you acquire the taste, there's nothing, you know, like poor is my favorite tea. But for other people, they really like the floral and aromatic and sometimes fruity and sweet and, and very nuanced flavors of oolong or something. And for them, poor is just gross, you know? So what I will say is that there's a lot of very bad poor in the world that like has flavors of ammonia and like musty dampness and swampiness. And like, it's because that fermentation process requires skill to produce it. And, you know, so let me know the name when you get a minute and I can mm -hmm. communicate to you what you might not, maybe not liking about it or something about the brewing method. There might be a way to prepare it. Like, one of our private reserve cakes is from um, Lao Mani village and it's near a famous um, place called Lao Banjang, which is known for um, it's known for the bitterness in the tea. And if you over brew this tea, if the water's too hot and you let it steep too long and there's too much leaf, it gets quite bitter and it's not, it's not great. Whereas if you, if you bring the amount of leaf and the steep time down just a little bit, then that sweet, the balance between sweetness is bitter is awesome. And it's an amazing tea. It's very dark and rich and thick and creamy and it's great. But again, you go a little bit too much leaf amount and it turns bitter. So mm -hmm. I just say that because sometimes you can shift the brewing method just a little bit and unlock the tea in a way that's really nice. Okay, cool. I will definitely find out the name of it. There are other players that I really love, so it's. I was just wondering why this one particular one. It does have a very like musty scent, even when it like even in the bag, it has a musty scent. But but yeah, I'll message you on Instagram later if that's okay. Yeah, and you can always when you know like I really love these couple of teas, you can always for example message us. And say, I really love teas like this, but I want to try another tea. And we'll, we'll make recommendations. Um, you know, I see my primary job in life is to source these teas and to produce them, but also to help find the teas for people that I think they're going to really love. You know, like that's, that's what I get excited about. So, um, so let me know. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. My pleasure. All right, we did the thing. Um, so I hope this, one thing that would be really helpful for us is, you know, getting into some of this linear information. I don't know if people find it valuable or interesting. So it's always helpful for, uh, for us to hear more from all of you about things you'd like to learn about. Um, you know, talking about tea, sharing about tea, dialoguing about tea is, after drinking tea, probably my second favorite activity on planet Earth. Um, and so, 
but you know we could go in a lot of directions we could talk about a lot of things so I, I just want to um, to make sure that we're sharing things that are really valuable for all of you out there so okay thanks my friends have a wonderful weekend I hope you're doing great and appreciate you spending some time on a Saturday morning and uh, hope you're drinking some great tea